Hello YouTube, N3SDO here with you again. This video documents my conversion of a failing VHF ham radio hybrid ring design duplexer to bandpass, band reject, or BPBR design. The Sinclair hybrid ring duplexer was built in about 1975 and has run a VHF 2 meter repeater for decades. The duplexer had been found to be the cause of intermittent scratchiness on the repeater. The club acquired another duplexer and this hybrid ring one was replaced. We decided to repair it and save it as a spare for the future. Upon getting the duplexer to my garage, decades of oxidation were discovered on all of the components and connectors. It was time for a disassembly and cleaning and some new components. The end connector T's in the hybrid ring cabling harness were unscrewed and turning the end connector threaded rings I could feel them crunch in my hand. There was also oxidation between the coax braid and the end type T connectors where the coax was crimped on. It was time for a new cable harness. Decades ago, you could purchase a new hybrid ring coax harness from Sinclair. But when I called, I was told that this design was obsolete and no longer supported. I contemplated rebuilding the hybrid ring harness myself. I tried to obtain the double crimp T-shaped end connectors that are used in the harness, but nobody had them in stock. And the manufacturer, Delta, required a 50-piece minimum order, which at $35 a piece would total $1,750. This was not in the budget. Although the hybrid ring design works very well, it's also very complex to cable up, and requires exacting cable lengths to get it to perform properly. The hybrid ring design is also no longer used by any of the duplexer manufacturers that I have found for VHF applications. All of them use band pass band reject design that consists of an adjustably tuned coupling loop along with tuned quarter wave resonators and a much simpler cabling harness. The hybrid ring resonator cavities that we have used rotatable top mount coupling loops, but the coupling loops were grounded and would need to be replaced or modified to have the variable capacitor and make them tunable. I researched duplexer coupling loops and found an article at repeater-builder.com. Not wanting to modify or damage the original coupling loops, I tried to locate some thick brass or thick copper sheet to make new mounting discs, but was unsuccessful. I was going to have to modify the originals. However, I did make a prototype loop with the same dimension as the originals out of some double-sided copper circuit board and some thin flat brass from the model train shop and a chassis mount end connector and a multi-turn Johansson compression trimmer capacitor. I have about 20 of these trimmers that were new old stock. I discovered I had a mechanical alignment issue between the coupling loop and the base. It was difficult to me to get exact 90 degree relationships between the loop and the base. I ended up using a small piece of wood to make an alignment fixture to hold the base and the loop correctly aligned when they were soldered. The prototype loop worked very well, and these capacitors allowed enough tuning range to cover the frequencies I need for both transmit and receive cavities without having to change the size of the loop. The original coupling loop assemblies were disassembled, modified, and reused. The end connector was press fit and soldered into the brass disc and then silver plated. I did not want to have to remove these. The flat silver plated coupling loop was removable by melting the solder and the connector holes were then cleaned of any remaining solder. It however left a rather oddly shaped item that was difficult to hold in order to drill. So a recess was carved into the wood alignment board to allow the clamps to be put on it for the use on a drill press. The grounding pins were drilled out 
and the hole enlarged for mounting the variable capacitors while the end connector was still in place. After drilling, the bases and end connectors were cleaned with baking soda and water to remove the oxidation and shine up the silver. After cleaning, the capacitors were mounted and then placed in the alignment jig and the coupling loops were reattached back to the capacitor and the end connector. With the modified coupling loops installed and a prototype cable harness made from leftover coax, the initial checkout looked very good. So I proceeded with the disassembly and removal of the resonator plungers from within the cavities. The bottom of these resonator cans come off and the resonator plungers come out the bottom with this design. The bottom of the can is held in place with a compression dimple, actually three of them around the perimeter. They were very tight and quite difficult to remove. I ended up prying them free from the bottom but I ended up bending up the bottoms that required some body work to pound them back into shape. I later realized that a long wooden dowel or a broom handle inserted into the resonator through the coupling loop opening in the top would have ejected the bottom covers much easier. After getting the bottoms off, the plungers were removed and given the baking soda treatment to remove any gunk. The finger stock was also cleaned and the interior of the cavity given a wipe down. I sprayed the plungers with deoxit fader lube oil during the reassembly to provide lubrication and protection from oxidation. When I put the bottom covers back on, I had to drill and use quarter inch screws and nuts to secure them in place after undoing the compression dimple retention, which I didn't have a tool to redo. I rough aligned the duplexer at home with my nano VNA, but the notch depth was below the nano VNA noise floor. However, I have access to both Agilent and Keysight spectrum analyzers with tracking generators at my workplace. Just the thing to do full and accurate alignment of this duplexer. I also made up another coax harness with the lengths of coax suggested by Kevin and measured the insertion loss and notch depth. The interconnect cables are supposed to be one quarter wavelength and accounting for the coax velocity should be about 14 and a half inches. I tried a couple of different cable lengths and discovered experimentally that the duplexer worked a bit better with shorter than anticipated cables. It turned out I was getting the best performance with one foot or 12 inch cables. There seems to be some additional capacitive loading from the coupling loop tuning that skews the cable length in some way. The 12 inch cables provided both reduced insertion loss and better notch depth as measured on both spectrum analyzers. The duplexer was tuned to provide about 1.2 decibels of insertion loss and notch depth of 85 decibels according to both spectrum analyzers. So I thank you for joining me for this video. Take care, catch you later. This is N3SDO. 73.